The Gospel According to Matthew. Words that may be familiar to many of us, but I invite us all to hear them now with fresh ears. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, a church lawyer, if you will, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment is in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Big statement for a rabbi to make. Hear what the Spirit is saying to us, the church. Would you pray with me? Oh God, we know the great commandment. Many of us may have it written, stamped on the back of our eyeballs. Now may it be writ large upon our hearts, seared into our soul, made flesh in our lives, that we may take away from the shares to come the message from Ron, from Michael, what next to open our eyes and see the glimpses of truth you have for each of us on this Pride Sunday and this Pride Month. We are grateful to be together once again today to hear the good news. In Christ's name we pray, and on the Holy Spirit's way. Amen. Amen. As we begin, on this Pride Sunday and this Pride Month, many of you recognize the face we see before us. And Michael, thank you for having a moment of silence for him last Wednesday night in our table talk. I just want to say I dedicate this message to our dear friend, Ed Harrelson. He was with us at BPC in all too brief three years before his untimely passage in 2017. Ed lives on in our hearts. Ed was a one, so those who did not know, he was a one-time evangelical. He came out as a gay man after hearing a voice whisper to him one day, there is no reason you cannot be who you are. Ed taught many years in Thailand. He served in the nonprofit world. He lived simply. He did not drive. And he often led our adult education and worship he was drawn to our church because of our active inclusion of God's rainbow people such as himself and the role he could play in that witness. And I have to say a personal note, he was also my housemate for two years in the church house before I married Rosa. Rosa and I remember him fondly, many of us do as well. Edmund yeah. Harrelson, presente. This is for you, my friend. Pride, a new way of knowing. I discovered this new way of knowing in the great commandment thanks to close friendships I had over the years with people such as Ed, with lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex person, and there are more. The self-identities are important. They are self-identities we need to cherish. And I encourage everyone to learn these terms behind the letters, if you haven't already, LGBTQI. So many marginalized still in many embedded ways. These neighbors of ours are those whom Jesus hangs out with then and now. Well, my epiphany around this passage happened as it so often happens, by hearing a good, good word like the one today, while reconciling, struggling to reconcile my world around me, the word and the world, the world and the word, and as a seminarian three decades past, I was struggling to reconcile this. 
how my many open lesbian, gay, and bisexual classmates who I studied with in seminary and did service with in seminary and prayed with in seminary, how they were investing boku bucks on their pastoral training. This is three decades ago, knowing full well there was no church call waiting them. I was struggling with this simple question. Why are you here? <laughs> You're spending 25 grand, that was 25 grand then, on a seminary education that's of no practical use to you, and you're here? I, I could not understand that. But what I did not know yet was my friends were being called, and perhaps they were calling me. Perhaps it was a higher calling, a higher calling I began to understand while listening to this passage afresh in Stewart Chapel on our San Francisco Theological Seminary campus, while sitting next to these classmates of mine, Susan and David, Lawrence and Lisa. The epiphany I experienced that day in Stewart Chapel when I heard this passage sitting to my next to my classmates of God's glorious rainbow was this. Jesus offers us here a new way of knowing. A new way of knowing already understood by my classmates, my long dismissed and forsaken neighbors. In this scripture today, Jesus' church legal adversary is a foisting the old scribal way of knowing onto him. These are probably people like him. He most likely, scholars believe, was a Pharisee, one who, who subscribed to the reform movement, building synagogues everywhere. But he start see, started seeing how those reforms were calcifying. But this scribe wanted to tell him who was in charge, meaning he wanted Jesus to know his scribal authority in all matters spiritual and the price Jesus would pay if he did not honor that. So he says, which commandment is the greatest of all? Knowing full well what the answer will be, as any trial lawyer would know the answer what it will be, how Jesus, a good rabbi, would respond with the central confession in all of Judaism, well, the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And Jesus says that. Jesus says that. Ah, the church lawyer now had him. I can hear this fellow saying, love God with all you have. You're quite correct, sir. And as you know, we are authorities on all that God has we are all authorities on this God that we all love. And based on our authority as the official arbiters of the holy, we can now tell you that as the keepers of our loving God, who your neighbors are to be, with whom you may relate and with whom you may not relate. And dear Jesus, it's not those on the margins you've been hanging out with. But as he so often does, Jesus sees the trap. And so he continues to a neglected aspect of their mutual Jewish law. Oh, and the second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It was scandalous to think of the people he hung out with as neighbors. Love your neighbor as yourself. So let us pause for a moment so we can see, see the new way of knowing that Jesus offers us here and how that gives pride to those long humiliated, whomever they might be. Pat, if you could put up the slide. First, there's this old way of the scribe our beliefs about a loving God as applied by vested authorities are to form our relationships. Some are in, some are out. The scribes determine, the church authorities determine where God's love goes. 
But now the new way of knowing, the new way of Jesus, our relationships with those without authority are to form our beliefs. You see the spiritual jujitsu here? He flips it. He flips it epistemologically. That's the way of knowing. He flips it sociologically. Our beliefs, relationships, now our relationships into our beliefs. Relationships with those who are marginalized are to form our beliefs. Not beliefs of the powerful are to form our relationships. That's being church. That is being the body of Christ. And that's the new way of knowing I heard in Stuart Chapel that day. And it seared my heart. For when I heard this anew, I looked around for Susan and David and Lawrence and Lisa. And I could now see that they who sacrificed so much to simply be there, they knew what Jesus was saying here. And that by my knowing them relationally, hanging out with Jesus' friends, I too could know Jesus. And only then could I confess my beliefs and rightly learn more about what to believe. Relationships with and among any peoples we marginalize, our world marginalizes, precedes, precede beliefs about them that preempt the relationships to begin with, knowing Actually, knowing precedes knowing about, and not vice versa. Never vice versa. Pat, thanks for the slide. And I had the beliefs. I was raised in the beliefs. I knew all about God, but I had not known in my careful Virginia Presbyterian upbringing. I had not known that these were neighbors of mine. I was never taught to even consider LGBTQ persons, I persons, even as neighbors. I had known, not known these neighbors. And yet, in order to survive, Susan and David, Lawrence and Lisa, they could not have helped but come to know the socially privileged like me. In order to survive, they could not have helped but come to know God. Which is, of course, what called them to seminary. To teach that to the church. Which is why we will hear today in just a moment. We will listen to Ron and to Michael share with us their good news. Share with us that through their knowing who they are and whose they are and reaching out to a world that so often does not, we can all do the same. We can all take pride in the knowing through knowing people like them, not about them, but them who are us. Some of you know the old poem. They drew a circle to keep me out. Heretic rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took them in. A new way of knowing. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.
please join me in singing the hymn of response, Be Thou My Vision. Now our dear church friend, member, and leader on our board, the session, Ron Grimm will share a word with each of us, what pride means to him. Ron? June 2003, Pride Month, 18 years ago, has deep and lasting memories for me. That is when I came out publicly. I moved from Columbia, Maryland into Washington, D.C. after 30 years of marriage and raising a family. With a year of counseling and legal negotiations, my wife and I decided to separate. At the beginning of June, following my daughter's final semester of college, we had a family meeting to make this announcement to our children. My son walked out in anger, but my daughter stayed to help me move out. My son didn't speak to me for another five years until his first child was born. Since then, my children have accepted my decision and have been part of my life, even attending my marriage to Michael in 2010. When I moved out, I moved into a small attic apartment on Capitol Hill, several miles from, or several blocks from the Library of Congress where I worked. This apartment was suggested by an openly gay colleague who was in many ways my mentor during this coming out process. He and his partner had been again, had been together since the early 1970s and they were originally from New York City. In fact, his partner uh, was a participant in the Stonewall Riots, the 52nd anniversary of which we remember tomorrow. During that month, I attended DC's Gay Pride Festival, where I witnessed a great diversity of people and was impressed with how openly they celebrated this event. Unfortunately, I was not quite as open about this new direction in my life. For example, 
I initially avoided walking directly from my apartment to the library because that route took me by a parking garage where one of my colleagues parked every day. Since she was a very ardent feminist, I feared that she would be supportive of my wife and upset with me. However, after a few days, I decided it was ridiculous for me to walk around the block to avoid encountering her and having her question what I was doing. Thus, I sat down with her one morning and told her the whole story. She became one of my strongest supporters and closest friends. However, the highlight of that June 2003 Pride Month was my decision to attend DC's Metropolitan Community Church. I felt welcome as I walked in and saw the array of rainbow flags lining the left and right sides of the sanctuary. Emotion overcame me when the service closed with everyone joining hands and singing the Lord's Prayer. While singing, I gazed at the large glass window at the front of the sanctuary. Its framing created a cross with a large tree providing the background. At that moment, I felt that I had made the right decision, even though it had been a painful process. I had entered that church alone, but I left feeling that I was accepted by this part of God's community. A lot has happened since that Pride Sunday in June 2003. Hopefully I've become more open and more accepting of who I am. I must say I had that same feeling that I had that day in June 2003 in March 2018, several days after my husband had passed, I walked down Wilson Lane and decided to go into the church on the left side of the street, attracted by the rainbow flags in the front lawn. I thought I would be welcome. And I'm glad to say I was. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you so much. <laughs> and now a brief word of introduction for Michael A.D. It's hard for me to be brief here, but that's why we put the words on the screen you're going to see here in a moment. Uh, Michael and I go back. I served on the More Light Presbyterians board in the early aughts, and Michael was the, our executive director and field organizer. And he did lead the charge to help open the doors of the church, the Presbyterian Church USA, widely to ordain leaders, regardless of sexual orientation and gender identification. Michael joined us for Table Talk on Wednesday, shared a bit about that movement of, and of course, what he's doing you see at the bottom. He founded the Global Faith and Justice Project. He's traveled worldwide advocating to end anti-homosexual homosexuality laws worldwide. Michael, welcome. You're traveling worldwide today, all the way from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Thank you for joining us and please share a good word with us. Ron, thank you so much for sharing your faith story, your journey story, your coming out story, your story that illustrates courage uh, and faith and love. I'm so glad you found yourself. I'm glad your family found you. I'm grateful that you, that you found that MCC church years ago and now Bethesda Presbyterian Church. My own connections with Bethesda Presbyterian Church go back more than a decade. Uh, when I was invited to do a weekend, uh, including preaching uh, from your former pastor, uh, Dan Christian, uh, also a graduate of San Francisco Theological Seminary, like Chuck. 
Uh, and indeed, Chuck, you and I go back two decades. Um, and I so appreciate who you are and the difference you make in the world. When I think about Bethesda Presbyterian Church, I love the tagline that you use, love in action. Um, and years ago, I remember uh, reading a, a small, tiny book, Love is a Verb. <laughs> and uh, I had those old school grammar teachers back in Louisiana and no, it, it was a noun. And, uh, but yes, Bethesda Presbyterian Church, you've got it right. Uh, love in action, love is a verb. Um, I'm so grateful that during the pandemic, uh, you reached out to your community and you fed uh, more than 40 people every single week. This kind of life-giving and life-saving work is a signature of who you are. I'm so grateful you're a sanctuary church uh, that your witness is one to say, we have safe space here uh, for persons that have been prevented uh, from full documentation and full citizenship. I'm so grateful for your commitment to anti-racism uh, and I strive to do that work uh, inside myself as well. And you saw the picture of me with my friends in Botswana uh, at the Pan-Africa Conference a couple years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm a white guy from the global north, uh, traversing the global south. And I do that with as much care and respect and cultural humility as possible. And on the left in that picture is Davis McElia, who is a gay Christian with a Catholic and Episcopalian background. And Davis uh, was from Nigeria and he fled Nigeria Um, he fled Nigeria. Um, thank you. That's Davis on the left. He fled Nigeria to literally save his life and went to the UK. He and I met at a global LGBTQI faith conference. And he said to me, Michael, would you work with me and help me raise money? I want to go back to West Africa and create uh, a network uh, to provide support and resource and sanctuary for LGBTI people uh, in my own land. Uh, and so I did so because I know how to write grants. I know how to work with funders. That, that's what I could do uh, and stand with Davis. That's the good news of it. And the hard news of it is just two weeks ago in one of the meetings that they were sponsoring, uh, 21 people were arrested uh, and it was simply a media training and this was in Nigeria. And Davis spent time and money uh, and at risk to his own life, uh, bringing them food in jail and working with pro bono attorneys uh, to get them out. And it took several weeks uh, for bail to be made and for a judge uh, to release them. Uh, they had done no wrong, to be clear. Uh, but they are not safe in, in Nigeria. As I think about this Pride Sunday and how you're celebrating, I'm so grateful for your commitment as an open and affirming congregation. And that, Chuck, you said wisely that it's a different way of knowing and it's a different way of looking at who is our neighbor. It was a scandalous book almost three decades ago by Virginia Mollencott and Letha Scanzoni. And the title puzzled me as a high school student. Um, it, it was, it's called, Is the Homosexual My Neighbor? And you know, it sounded like an anti-gay book to me, <laughs> but, uh, but I found a copy uh, and read it and it was applying the Great Commandment text. And Virginia Mollencott, um, a lesbian worked with an ally partner, Letha Scanzoni, uh, and wrote that groundbreaking book. When I think about our Presbyterian context, I think about David Sent in 1974 at a National Presbyterian General Assembly. He held up a sign, is anybody else out there gay? And that was the stonewall moment for the Presbyterian church. And I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to work 
to end those barriers to ordination and begin the process toward marriage equality in the Presbyterian Church. But toward the end of that work, as I shared in my table talk on Wednesday, I began to look at the Presbyterian Church globally. There are Presbyterians in over 100 countries, and the Presbyterian Church in the United States has direct mission relationships with 50 of those countries. And in most of them, uh, anti-LGBT laws still existed uh, because of colonial laws, because of new anti-homosexuality laws. So LGBTQI people were very much in harm's way. Um, and where there is criminalization, there will be persecution. Um, I, I'm grateful to report when I started this work in 2012, there were 80 countries where it was illegal to be gay or have same-sex relationships uh, and the death penalty in 10. It's now 70 countries. So 10 countries have made uh, this wonderful move toward removing criminalization. Last night, I watched the New Mexico Gay Men's Chorus, and it was an incredible concert called Unbreakable. Uh, and it was about the untold stories of our community. And one of those stories was the iconic American novelist that you know by name, uh, that I know by name, uh, but I didn't know a whole lot about her, um, Gertrude Stein and her partner, her spouse, uh, the person she loved and shared a home with, Alice B. Toklas. And one of the things that they quoted in the concert was a statement from Gertrude Stein. And, and it, it struck me then, and, it, and I must share it today. Um, one of the things that she said was, one must dare to be happy. <laughs> and I thought, wow, who's saying that to me? Gertrude Stein, a lesbian, who grew up in the Midwest, who fled to Paris to have her own life, who had a salon celebrating artists and poets. Um, she and Alice had an incredible relationship for 40 years. And to the LGBTQ people within Bethesda and those who will watch this recording, I want you to listen very clearly to Gertrude Stein. One must dare to be happy. Uh, please know that you are a child of God, created in God's image, and loved exactly as you are. To my friends at Bethesda Presbyterian Church who are allies, thank you for your voice. Thank you for your solidarity. I believe it's more important now than ever, particularly for trans children gender non-conforming, non-binary children that a political target has been put on their back. And for black and brown trans women who are sadly, tragically murdered in our cities almost every day. So it's really important to think about what it means to be an ally to trans, gender non-conforming, non-binary people. And I know you'll take that to heart. One of the things I know about you, Bethesda Presbyterian Church, is that faith and social justice are in harmony. And I think about Audre Lorde, the wonderful black queer poet who said decades ago, we do not live single issue lives. So I'm grateful Bethesda Presbyterian Church because you care about everyone and no one is outside of God's love or your care. Bless you, happy pride. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Ron, Michael, bless you for your testimony, your witness. We call it witness Presbyterians. I suppose other churches may say testimony, but we're so glad to have you and share with us today.